This cutting board has a flat surface, but it has a design that gives the illusion of three-dimensional cubes. This technique was popular in Louis XIV furniture, so these cubes are known as Louis cubes. You'll also see them called tumbling blocks. When Louis cubes are used as furniture decoration, the pieces are usually veneer, cut with a razor knife. And you can find lots of videos on the web describing how to do that. There are fewer videos about doing Louis cubes in solid wood like this. The ones I found were either short on detail or they used techniques that actually didn't work out very well for me. In this video, I'll show you how, to, how I make cutting boards like this one, and I hope I can spare you some of the trial and error that I had to go through. You start by cutting a bunch of identical pieces from three different wood species. The board I showed you used 22 pieces of curly maple, 25 pieces of cherry, and 25 pieces of walnut. Each piece is a trapezoid, more specifically a rhombus, which means that all four sides are the same length. Two of the angles are 60 degrees, the other two are 120 degrees. Three of these pieces fit together to form a cube. I cannot emphasize strongly enough that these pieces need to be cut precisely. The angles need to be exact. A tenth of a degree off is too much. The sides need to be exactly the same length. A hundredth of an inch off is too much. Otherwise, the pieces won't fit together perfectly, and the more pieces you assemble, the worse it will get. I'll show you how to get that kind of accuracy. The jig you'll need to build is just a simple crosscut sled with a fence angled for a 60 degree cut. Like any table saw sled, it uses a glide bar that fits into a miter slot. This sled will never have to make any heavy cuts or be subject to any big twisting forces, so one glide bar should be enough. I used a zero play glide bar, which I'd never tried before, and it works very well. There's a push block aligned with the glide bar in the miter slot, and there are blocks at each end of the sled just to uh, keep it together once you've made a cut uh, all the way through the base of the sled. The fence has two attachments. This stop block has a 60 degree angle on this end and also on this end, but that's not important. And it has a slot that allows you to move it back and forth to adjust the size of the pieces that you want to cut. The hold down, this, this hold down uh, device here keeps your, the piece you're cutting registered firmly against the base of the sled and it allows it to nestle between the uh, fence here and that uh, angle in the, in the stop block. Here's how you use the jig. You cut your stock a little bit wider than you want the final pieces to be. Then you make an initial cut to put an angle on the end of this stock. Then this piece will slide right in and fit in that uh, little angled area made by the stop block. Snug it down with this hold down, cut. Then you move this piece out, you turn it over like that, put it back in snug it down, and cut again. Move just a little sliver off. And that leaves you with a perfectly cut block. At that point, you're already ready to cut the next piece. and so on. The method I just showed you requires two cuts for each piece. 
If you could cut your strip of stock to be exactly as wide as you want the final pieces to be, you could make just one cut and then immediately cut the next one and so forth. This would be much faster. And in principle, there's a way to do that. If, let's suppose this is a piece of the stock that you're gonna make the blocks out of. If you're willing to sacrifice a small amount of it, you can take a wider piece of it and put a 60 degree angle on one end of it using the jig, just as I've done here. Now having done that, if you put it in this way and make a cut, well, in, you've got it up against the same stock block as, stop block as you're gonna be using for the pieces. It's got the same angle, so in principle, you're going to make exactly, this piece is going to be, that you're going to cut is going to be exactly the width that you want. And there's at least one web video that suggests doing it that way. And in fact, the reason that this jig is as long as it is, is that I thought I might want to do that. What I found, though, is that making a long cut like this magnifies any tiny inaccuracy in the fence angle or the way you put the piece in or, or a little piece of, of sawdust under something or whatever. And you end up with a difference between the width of the pieces that, that you cut from this end of the strip compared to the ones at that end that's several times as large as the, as the errors you get uh, with the two-cut method. And that will come back to bite you at assembly time. So I don't recommend doing it that way. I'll mention five keys to accuracy for the jig. The first three are easy. The last two take a little work. One. Make sure your table saw blade is a very good 90 degrees to the base of the jig. Two, once you've set the stop block and cut some blocks, don't move it until you've cut all the blocks you're going to need and a few spares. If you absolutely have to interrupt it for some reason, you can make a find, find something or, or grind something down that exactly fits in the curve of the saw that the curve the saw leaves and then take an existing block and use it to uh, adjust the fence against. Three, don't let sawdust accumulate between the cuts and the angle where the stop block meets the fence. Four, make sure the fence is very straight. This one had made a trip through the jointer after I assembled the vertical and the horizontal parts. And five is the big one. Really dial the fence angle in to exactly 60 degrees. Here's what I learned the hard way. Using a digital angle gauge to set the fence isn't good enough. And using a known 60 degree angle to set the fence isn't good enough either. You have to check using pieces you actually cut, then tweak as necessary. If we were working with 43 degree angles or something, that would be very hard but with 60 degree angles, geometry comes to our rescue. When you make a cut in a rectangular board at 60 degrees, you also make a 120 degree cut, and three of those should act exactly fit together. So start by putting a screw into one end of the horizontal part of the fence. Go ahead and use an angle gauge or known 60 degree angle to set the fence angle initially. Put a temporary screw in the other end of the fence. Get three short boards with nice parallel sides and cut the end of each in the jig with the initial fence setting. Now make a V with two of them and see if the third piece fits with no gaps. In this case it does because I've already done the adjustment on this jig. It's more likely that the piece won't fit perfectly on the first try. If you have a gap at the outside, you need to move the far end of the fence back. If the combined lengths of your three cuts are about the same as the fence length, the gap size is about how far you'll need to move the fence back. Take the temporary screw out, tweak the fence, put the screw back in a new hole. If the gap is on the inside, the far end of the fence needs to go forward. After moving the fence, recut the board ends, check again, repeat until it's perfect. This is my fence. Obviously, I had to repeat several times. Some of those are because at first I used a less accurate way to test the fit than the one I just showed you. The pieces this jig will cut can be pretty small, and you want to hold them snugly against the jig base, fence, and stop block. I don't know of an off-the-shelf clamp or hold-down that will work as conveniently as this one does, and it's quite easy to make. At the heart of it is a 5 16 connector bolt, 7 8 inches long, that you can usually get at any hardware store that sells 5 16 threaded rod. 
I'm saying 5 16 specifically because 5 16 nuts are half an inch wide across the flats, which is also the thickness of two pieces of quarter inch MDF. Unlike plywood, quarter inch MDF really is a quarter of an inch. Here are the parts for the hold down. Rip a piece of quarter inch MDF 7 8 wide and cut two pieces 5 or 6 inches long and four pieces about half that length. The other parts are the connector nut, a 5 16 threaded rod about 6 inches long, and a piece of wood or cork or rubber to use as a foot, and a 5 16 threaded knob, either shop built like this one or off the shelf. On each of the four short pieces of MDF, cut a 60 degree bevel on one end. You happen to have a perfect tool for this in your partially built jig. Glue the four short MDF pieces into two pieces with a V at one end. These pieces will now perfectly capture the connector nut. Glue it in place. Glue the longer MDF pieces onto both sides. The naked bottom of the threaded rod might mar your cut pieces, so make a foot of some kind. I drilled a 5 16 hole into a piece of half inch dowel. Thread the rod through the connector nut, glue the foot of the knob on, and it's ready to attach to the jig. Here are all the cut pieces for this build. It only took about 40 minutes to cut them all. That's another argument for the two cut method. Even if you could save half that time with a one cut approach, any loss of precision would cost you a lot more time during assembly than you saved. In some videos I watched, people did assembly with regular wood glue using rubber bands for clamps. First they would glue up individual cubes like this, then they would glue a few of those cubes together with bigger rubber bands, and then add a few more glue cubes on, and so on. Those people must be much more skilled than I am, because this method was something of a disaster when I tried it. When things start not fitting well, there's nothing you can do about it other than letting gaps accumulate, or doing some very difficult planing or sanding to make the pieces fit. First, you want a nice flat surface to work on, and one that lets you easily scrape off any glue squeeze out that accumulates as you're working. This polished granite floor tile works perfectly. It costs four to eight bucks at Home Depot, depending on the color. And because it's portable, you don't have to do the assembly in your shop. You can do it on your kitchen counter or a breakfast table while you're watching this old house or something on TV. Second, the glue. I use this DAP Rapid Fuse glue instead of regular wood glue. This is their medium body CA glue. There's nothing magic about that brand that I know of, but you don't want to use a liquid CA glue because most of the joints are end grain on one side, and you don't want the glue to wick in and disappear immediately. This particular stuff sets in 30 seconds, which is just about perfect. You have enough time to get the pieces positioned the way you want, but you don't have to hold them forever. There's no clamping involved other than your hand pressure. Pay attention to grain direction. It's not important which grain directions you choose, but it's important to be consistent. If most of your walnut pieces are running vertically, a horizontal one is just going to look wrong. I put the pieces together one at a time because that way if a problem arises, I can usually correct it before it propagates. And a problem usually does arise for one reason or another. Here we have our first problem. When I dry fit this piece, it should be flush with this one. But I can see and feel that it's not. It's, this piece is too large by maybe a 64th of an inch or so. I tried another piece and it's the same, so the problem is that in, in what I've done previously, the thing has gotten just a little bit out of alignment somehow. Um, it's always hard to figure out exactly how that happens, but it does happen and it needs to be corrected before it propagates. The key to fixing this and uh, to measuring it and fixing it is just a regular old uh, $8 set of feeler gauges. I can, I've already checked this and found the right one, so I know that, that if I take uh, an 18 thousandth gauge and uh, put it on the one piece, now, now they'll align very well. So I need to shorten this piece by 18 thousandth of an inch and I've already marked the side that I want to remove the material from. To trim it, I put the piece back into the 
jig, but I put that same feeler gauge blade between the piece and the stop block. Tighten it down. Now the piece fits perfectly and I've gone ahead and glued it in. But what if the problem had been in the other direction? What if this piece had been a little bit too small? Well, you could move the stop block and cut a larger piece in the jig, but the easiest thing to do would have been to go ahead and put this piece in and the next one. And then when we went to put this piece in, it would have been too large and we could have trimmed it. Here is the completed assembly. It doesn't look great, it doesn't feel great, but the hard part is over. Soon it will look and feel terrific. The remaining steps are to flatten, trim, fill, and finish. I'll have just a little to say about each of those steps. Even if all your stock is exactly the same thickness, the top and bottom won't be perfectly flat unless you're much better at this sort of thing than I am. Normally I would use a planer for flattening a piece like this, and many people would use a hand plane. I'm afraid to do it that way though because there's no direction that's not across the grain for some of the pieces, and I don't want to do all this work and then have tear-out problems. It seems safer to go with abrasives. The perfect tool for flattening something like this is a drum sander like this one. If I didn't have that, I think I would use a combination of an orbital sander and some patience. Once the piece is flattened, the trimming can be done on the table saw. If the project is a standalone board like this one, rather than a decorative insert, you'll also want to round or ease the edges at this point. I'm rounding the edges at the router table, and tear out is a danger there also. I'll move it more slowly than I normally would. I'd rather have a little burning that's easily sanded off than chips that I'd have to fill. Despite all your efforts at precision, if you're like me, there will be some micro gaps here and there. Here's one that is just big enough to put a razor blade in. They may not seem very noticeable, but they will still be improved by applying some wood filler with a color close to one of the woods bordering the gap. I use this Timbermate uh, water-based filler, which has maple, cherry, and walnut colors, and is really easy to use. After final sanding, you can use whatever finish you like. Since what I'm making is a cutting board, I use a food safe finish whether or not I think the board will actually be used that way. This butcher block finish consists of mineral oil, beeswax, and carnauba wax. It's really easy and foolproof to use and it leaves a very, very nice feel. You can Google food safe wood finishes and find lots of other options that you can buy or make yourself. Here's the finished piece. I'm really pleased with how it turned out with one really big exception. The more sharp-eyed viewers may have realized way before I did that I've been making the wrong pattern from the very beginning. Compare the new one to the one I made before it, which I did right. This one, let's just put it in the center here, um, this one is symmetrical in the three colors. The way I have it oriented now, you see the maple pieces forming rows corner to corner, going horizontally. And if I were to turn it 60 degrees, now you see the walnut ones forming rows corner to corner. And they look like they could be the top or the bottom of the cubes now, depending on how your eyes are seeing this. And if I turn it in the third direction, now the cherry pieces are corner to corner forming rows and they look like they're the tops or the bottoms of the cubes. So no matter what direction you're looking at this from, you'll get a similar kind of three-dimensional uh, illusion from it. Whereas the new one, it's subtly different. The, the maple pieces are the same. They're, they're forming corner to corner rows, but now the walnut and cherry are forming stripes that are going vertically. And it's not that, that it's not still three-dimensional in the other directions, but now if I turn it this way, you have to look a little harder to see it because there are still corner-to-corner -corner rows, but they're alternating cherry and walnut. 
and the the effect just isn't as immediately obvious and and is more jumbled looking so it's not it's not what I intended and it's not what you typically uh, expect when you hear the term Louis cubes. This pattern change snuck up on me because I just didn't realize it was a mistake I could make so I made it. As I now know very well if you pick any given piece uh, let's say this this maple piece right here then you want the walnut pieces to be on opposite sides of the, the rhombus and the cherry pieces to be on the other opposite sides of the rhombus. What you don't want is what you have here, starting from this one, where now you have the walnut pieces on adjacent sides and the cherry pieces on adjacent sides. And you can start with any color and, and end up with the same, the same result. So this is what your finished piece should look like. Do as I say, not as I do, and you should have a great result. I'm going to get started on my next one because I'm going to need to make one more of these than I thought I would. Thanks for watching.